Accumulation functions have historically been a monster topic on the AP exam, so we are going to stretch this topic out and spend a second day on it. Um, and today we're going to put all of our energy into looking at two former AP questions back from 2002. Uh, but basically, to kind of summarize what you're going to see on all these questions, it's very, uh, for the most part, they're very predictable as to how the College Board is going to go about questioning you on these. Basically, they're going to present you with a function, and that function is going to be defined in terms of an integral. Uh, you know, the lower bound is probably going to be a constant. The upper bound is going to be some function of x. Typically, it's just x itself. And then f is going to be defined in terms of t. A lot of times, what's going to happen is they're going to give you, uh, when we talk about what's given, they're going to give you a graph of f of t. Okay, and then they're going to ask you a bunch of questions about g. They're going to ask you, hey, you know, when's g, you know, increasing, or when's g decreasing? Uh, you know, when does he have a max or a min? Or they may ask you, um, you know, certain things like when's g concave up, when's g concave down, or when does it have a point of inflection? And so basically, what's going to happen is as we go through those questions, you know, we're going to say, well, the derivative of g requires the second fundamental theorem. Okay, because it's the derivative of an integral, and uh, you know all we end up getting here is that g prime equals f of x, and we want to keep it that simple. It's really straightforward, you know. And then if we took one more derivative, we'd say, well, g double prime is really the first derivative of f, and that's all there is to it. All right, saddle up. Here we go. Uh, we are looking at a 2002 question off the AB exam, uh, but it's just as likely to show up on the BC exam. It's very typical. And uh, again, look at this. They gave you a picture of f, but then they defined g. G is the accumulation function, okay? Not f. G is the accumulation. And very straightforward. We got an integral from 0 to x of f, yada, yada. Um, and just kind of glance over all four parts right now. Um, you know, this is very typical where we're going to have to find a g, a g prime, and a g double prime value. Um, you know, they're going to talk about, you know, when's g increasing? When is g concave down? So just to kind of summarize, g is increasing, we're going to look at g prime. For concave down, we're going to look at g double prime. And then they're going to finish it off by asking us to roughly sketch g. So that's where we're going with this one. All right, so I've copied and pasted the picture, and I've taken away parts B, C, and D so that we could, you know, not to be distracted, and then I'll have enough room to kind of write what I need to write here. Um, but uh, so let's start with G of negative 1. So there's three points at stake here, one point for G of negative 1, one for G prime, and one for G double prime. And by definition, we're going to substitute a negative 1 in for X. And so what is this question asking? How would you describe this question? Well, what we're doing is we're trying to calculate the area that's bounded between F of X or f of t, and the x-axis. Now the first miniature little bear trap is that we are going to have to switch the bounds so that negative 1 is the lower and 0 is the upper, and then we'll negate. And as I look at the region up here, from negative 1 to 0, we're looking at a triangle that is above the x-axis. It's got a, a base of, let's see, 1 unit and a height of 3. So I'm thinking negative 3 halves is the answer for g of negative 1. All right, switch colors here. Let's do g prime of negative 1. Well, we know that g prime of x is just simply f of x. So when they wanted g prime of negative 1, all i got to do is f of negative 1. How would you summarize that question? Well, what we're going to do is we're just going to simply read the graph. Read the value of the graph. That's how we want to summarize it. And when x equals negative 1, bang, right there it is. We've got an answer of 0. All right, uh, let's do g double prime. Now, g double prime of x is simply f prime of x. So, let's see, g double prime of negative 1 is really f prime of negative 1. And, again, let's work on describing this. We're not doing area, We're not gonna, and, and we're also not going to read the value of the graph. What we're going to do is we're going to read the slope of the graph. All right, so let's make a little note here. We're going to read the slope of the graph. So specifically at negative 1, it looks like I've got a linear function that's got a rise of 3 and a run of 1. So I'm going to say the answer is 3. So we're going to go, as far as the scoring goes on the AP exam, we're going to go plus 1 for having the negative 3 halves. We're going to go plus 1 more for having the 0 and plus 1 for having the 3 for a grand total of 3 points. So hopefully we're walking home with 3 out of 3 there. Okay, part B. They wanted to know when is... Um, 
G increasing. Okay, so what's gone through your mind already? And, and I'm, you're going to hear me say this a million times this year. What separates good mathematicians from great, great elite mathematicians? And I think the difference is those top end students, their brain is already thinking three steps ahead of where their pencil is. So as soon as I read increasing, you know, I'm telling myself, I got to go find out when G prime is positive. That thought popped into my head instantly. And so, and I know G prime is equivalent to F. So I'm going to go ahead, you know, I'm going to make a sign chart. I'm going to say, okay, where are the critical points? There's a critical point in negative 1 and positive 1. So let's see, negative 1, positive 1. And let's see, F is negative, and then F is positive, and then F is negative again, a.k.a. Uh, I'm going to put a B for below, an A for above, and a B for below. That's all I'm doing. And, um, and again, I want to label the top half of this. I'm going to say, you know what, this is G prime slash F values because they're one and the same. What does that tell me about G? It tells me G is decreasing, then increasing, and then decreasing. How am I going to answer this question? How am I going to explain my answer? Well, I'm going to say G is increasing uh, from negative 1 to 1 because G prime slash F is positive. That's all there is to it. All right, part C. Hey, they want to know when's G concave down. Again, what's instantly flashing in your mind? Well, the first thing is we got to say, we got to figure out when's G double prime negative, right? And we know that G double prime of X is equivalent to, let's see, whoops, 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 F prime of X. So what I'm going to do is, again, I'm going to try to make a sign chart. And I'm going to set this bear equal to zero, and I'm also going to ask myself, when is it undefined? Well, I know that F prime, if I'm reading slopes, is never equal to zero on this picture, but there is a moment where it's undefined. Where is F prime undefined? Hopefully, you said at x equals zero. Right up there at the tip top, the slope is undefined. There is no tangent line that exists. We say that the curve, or we say the graph of F is non-differentiable at x equals zero. And then I'm reading slopes. So all the slopes are positive here, and then all the slopes are negative. I'm going to label my sign chart here. This is G double prime slash F prime. What does that tell me about G? It tells me G's concave up, and then he switches, and he's concave down. So we've proven there is a point of inflection at zero if they had asked for that, but they didn't. And how am I going to answer my question? How am I going to explain my answer? I'm going to say G is concave down um, from zero to two. I Notice, now, if you said zero to infinity, I know what you mean. But remember, we have an interval that shuts off at two. Because G double prime slash F prime is negative. Okay. Now, as a substitute there, and I'm going to put this in parentheses, you could have said G prime slash F is doing what? Decreasing. That would also be an acceptable answer in place of saying this, but I do prefer this up here. It keeps it simple for me. All right, now part D here is a big culminating event. We're going to kind of reflect back, and we're going to look at our answers from part A, part B, and part C, and kind of synthesize all that information together to come up with this beautiful beautiful graph of F. So a couple of things that I've imported here is I, I brought into the screen, and, I, and you have it right in front of you in your notebook, I brought in G prime up here, and that told us that G was decreasing and then increasing and then decreasing. I also brought in my sign chart for the second derivative that said G's concave up and then concave down with a point of inflection right there, zero. And I also brought in my part A answer where G of negative one is equal to negative three halves. Now if you're ever going to do a graph, the more points you have to plot, the better off you are. So I strongly suggest, even though they didn't ask for these other ones, I strongly suggest getting g of negative 2, which is the integral from 0 to negative 2. What you notice is even, I don't even care about switching my bounds because I got two congruent triangles that offset each other, so I know that answer is 0. I know that g of 0, the integral from 0 to 0 is 0. I know that g of positive 1, which is the integral from 0 to 1, is equal to positive 3 halves. And I also know that g of 2, the integral from 0 to 2, again, has two triangles that are congruent and offset each other, and therefore the value is 0. So I always strongly suggest getting specific points that you can plot as you get ready to graph. All right, let's see if I can squeeze this bear in there. In fact, let's do it in a black pen here. All right. So um, I'll tell you what, if you happen to have uh, one of those post-its, not a bad idea to maybe rip one of those bears off and slap it in your notebook just to kind of neaten it up and add a little sophistication to your notebook. But I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to plot those points. Um, let's see if that's 1 and that's negative 1. I've got a 0 here. I've got uh, negative 3 halves. Negative, also known as negative 1.5. I've got 0. I've got a positive 1.5. I've got 0. And uh, I just got to make sure that I'm concave up at the right times. 
and do, 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 do. so I'm decreasing until negative one, hit my relative min, I'm gonna change the increasing. When I hit zero, I have a point of inflection, and I tell you what, this really feels like the sine curve. It's very, very similar to the sine curve. This, ladies and gentlemen, is my best picture for g of x. All right, we got another question from 2002. It was on a different form. It didn't show up on the exact same exam, but there is um, uh, one of the things we'll talk about at some point is there is uh, what's called a form B. So this was on 2002 form B. Basically, all you need to know is that form B is an exam that's administered in different time zones. We will not see form B per se. Uh, but it's the same style of question. They introduce G. They define G as this um, as this uh, accumulation function. The only thing that's different is they threw in this five right um, being added to the integral. But you're going to find out that it really doesn't change too much. The other thing that's different is that F itself is not linear in nature. It's got a significantly more curvature to it. So we'll see if that changes anything. Um, let's get started here. G of six. G of six by definition. If I substitute the six in for x, I'm going to get five plus. The integral from 6 to 6, ooh, I like that. Love it when the bounds are the same, huh? So that integral just has a value of 0. Add the 5 onto that, and we simply get 5. Not bad, not bad. All right, now we know that g prime of x, if I derive this function here, the 5 turns into a 0, and the integral disappears, so I just get f of x. So g prime of 6 is the same thing as f of 6. It's one and the same. There's no difference. And so I'm going to read the graph. Again, I'm going to make this comment here just to drive it home. I am reading the value of the given graph. And on that graph, I'm at, when x is 6, I've got a value of 3, so the answer is 3. And then uh, last but not least, g double prime. Okay, so let's see if we can create a little space here. G double prime of x is the same thing as f prime, which is the slope of the given picture. G double prime of 6 is the same thing as f prime of 6. Again, what are we reading? We are reading. This is what we have to have a firm grasp of. We are reading the slope of the given graph, in this case f. So I'm going to go back, and I'm going to look at my picture. And what they did specify back in the beginning was that the graph have f has a horizontal tangent line at 6. That's the key. So right here at 6, you're guaranteed a horizontal tangent line, which of course has a slope of 0. And bada bing, bada boom, g double prime of 6 is 0. All right, so we talk about, you know, that, that first instinct. The moment you read the question, you know, it, how instantly is your pencil moving? The moment I read this question and I see G decreasing, my brain is already saying G prime has got to be negative. What do you know about G, or G prime? We already know that G prime, get my prime in there, is equal to F. So let's go ahead. Let's set it equal to 0. We know that F is equal to 0 right here at 0 and 12. Let's construct our sign chart. And we could say g prime slash f. We've got x equals 0. We've got x equals 12. I've got a bunch of negatives. And then we're above. And then f's below, aka negative. What does that tell us about g? g's decreasing. g's increasing. g's decreasing. Um, keep in mind the interval here. So we're not using negative infinity or positive infinity for my outer bounds. I'm going to say that g is decreasing. All right, we got two intervals from negative 3 to 0 union. 12 to 15 because why g prime slash f is negative how easy is this yes we're making it look easy how quickly did you get started as soon as you glanced at part c here g's concave down what's the first thing that flashed through your mind g double prime's got to be negative no questions asked g double prime of x is the same thing as f prime of x all right, let's see if we can get a little sign chart cooking. If I set f prime equal to 0, now I'm reading slopes. Let's see. No, no, not right there. It's still, in, still positive. Slopes positive, positive, positive. Bingo, right there is 6. I think 6 is the only critical point. I'm also asking myself, is the slope ever undefined? Like the last picture that we saw was not differentiable. That is not the case this time. This curve is always differentiable. Therefore, f prime does always exist, but there is that critical point is 0. So let's see, g double prime slash f prime. Got a whole bunch of positive slopes, and then we got a bunch of negative slopes. So what do we know about g? We're concave up, and then we're concave down. I'm going to say g's concave down from 0 to 15, because g double prime slash f prime is negative. 
boom, there it is. All right, here's a little difference. Uh, we did not see this one in the last part. Last part, by the time we got to D, they wanted us to sketch G. That's not the case right now. But they do want us to evaluate, or approximate anyway, this definite integral by using some trapezoidals. Just to recap, a real quick review of our trapezoids. I'll slide up here. Our trapezoids are oriented um, in a you know tall, skinny fashion. A lot of times they may either, you know, they're either going to look like this or they'll look like this. Okay? Either way, we've got our base down here. We've got our first height. We've got our second height. And we said the area is going to be one half h sub 1 plus h sub 2 times the base. All right? And that's the formula we're using for the area. And I'm going to have to go ahead and I'm going to have to calculate the area of each individual trapezoid. Let's go ahead and come up with some good drawings here. Um, they want six subintervals, each with a, a change of, in t of three. So I'm going to go from negative three to zero. Bang, bang. That one's kind of unique. It turns out to be a triangle. And then from zero to three. Now what I'm thinking already is those are congruent triangles. They're going to offset each other. So I'm not even going to worry about them. And then you kind of fast forward and you see the same characteristic taking place over here. Again, you've got... You've got these triangles above and below. They're congruent. They're going to offset each other. So what I want you to do is I want you to not even worry about these suckers. Just cross them off. Where are we going to put all of our energy? I'm going to, do, I'm going to go from 3 to 6. And then what I'm going to do is I know that from 6 to 9 is the same thing. So I'm not even going to worry. I'm just going to go 3 to 6 and double it. So I got 1 half. The height when x equals 3 is 1. The height when x equals 6 is 3. And then the base from 3 to 6 is 3. So I got half of 4 is 2. 2 times 3 is 6. Now that's the area of this one, so that area is there. The cumulative area, I'm going to say that integral is approximately 12 units. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope you feel a little better about accumulation functions than we did um, you know, 24 or 36 hours ago. We're building confidence. Uh, the hard work pays off. The cream always rises to the top. So stick with it. Hang tough. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow.